Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the, the Eurexa workshop. Uh, today, we're going to be uh, presenting on a variety of topics um, out of the Eurexa project, which is a European Union funded project under the uh, um, FET HPC uh, Horizon 2020 program. Um, our, our first presenter today is going to be Paul Carpenter from uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Uh, he's going to be presenting on the resiliency aspects of um, the Eurexa project and uh, as part of the resiliency initiative uh, that Barcelona Supercomputing Center um, is uh, uh, undertaking. Uh, Paul, over to you. Hi, good morning. So I trust that you can see my screen. Peter, can you can you see it? Yeah, fine? I can see it. It's all good. Okay, so let me start then. So this is a presentation about um, <clears throat> a resiliency work that we led uh, at PSC uh, in the Eurexa project. It's called Cost Aware Prediction of Uncorrected DRAM Errors in the Field. Just hold on a second, Paul. Sorry. Um, I forgot to mention uh, if you guys have any questions, there's a Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. And at the end of each presentation, we will be pausing for hands up moments for verbal questions as well, once we've exhausted written questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. So I, I actually won't see the questions until I come to the end of the presentation. Uh, Peter, if there's any that are really pertinent, feel free to interrupt me and I can, I can answer them as we go. No worries. Okay, so this, uh, the aim of this study is really to understand and quantify whole system resiliency problem on a production machine. We focused on memory errors, which are actually one of the most important causes of uh, hardware failure. And one basic thing just to say at the very beginning is of course there's a distinction between corrected and uncorrected errors. Corrected errors are a failure of the memory device, maybe the memory interface, but not a failure of the whole system or the node. So generally, as far as the application is concerned, corrected errors are, are, are not a problem. Whereas uncorrected errors, of course, um, <clears throat> typically cause the node to be rebooted or taken out of service. This means that a whole, if it's an HPC job, the whole job is terminated and all the compute time since the last checkpoint uh, is lost. So this is, it's kind of obvious that we should be dealing with uncorrected errors, but it's surprising how many studies, if you read the studies, you find that they're actually talking about corrected errors, which is not uh, the real problem. So everything I'm going to talk about today, or virtually everything, uh, is in the publication, which uh, we published last year in supercomputing. Uh, if you want to search for the publication while we're going, uh, well, actually, the title's in the bottom of every slide, so you don't need to, uh, to write it down here. Also, the code uh, is open source. Uh, we use production logs. They are, of course, not open source. We don't have uh, permission to um, to release them either from the supercomputing center ourselves or our, our vendor. I mean, we, we cannot release them. There's a synthetic log to play around with, but really you need your own logs to, uh, to work with this. So on the question of log, uh, we worked with Marinostrum 4, which is, well, it's the previous generation, but the log was taken during the production period, uh, October to, well, not during a production a period of production uh, 2014 to 2016. It's a large scale machine, 3000 nodes, 25,000 DIMMs. In fact, all three major manufacturers of uh, DRAM are represented. I don't have the figures right there. I could look them up, but with a non-trivial number of DIMMs from each of them. Uh, in the study, there's some uh, distinction and discussion about differences, anonymized, of course. We, of course, we cannot say <laughs> who is who, but, you know, we have A, B, and C. Uh, during that period of just over two years, there were four and a half million corrected errors, so lots, but only 333 uncorrected errors. And the UEs are also quite bursty. You tend to have... Uh, a UE and then bang, 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 a few more UEs uh, right in succession. So really only the first one is going to matter. So once you deal with this burstiness aspect, you're down to 67 UEs. So there's many orders of magnitude, as of course people know, right, between corrected errors uh, and UEs. 
Another thing uh, of, um, in terms of obvious things, uh, it's, it's not really so obvious, but it's really important, which is, uh, we're going to talk about cost benefit of different things. This is an important thing, but just in the moment, uh, we use the real dis distribution of HPC jobs from actually, this was um, a different time period, uh, but probably in terms of statistics, generally the same. Really important thing that you have to know when you're working in this field is that the size of HPC jobs is extremely skewed in terms of the number of nodes that they run on and the time that they run for. So lots and lots of very small jobs, but also a few really massive ones. Uh, and if you look at the average job length, you know, you've got all your jobs, what's the average length? It's about five node hours. So, okay, it's something, but it's not massive. But the average length of a job containing one of these UEs is more than 500 node hours. So you think, how can this be? This is, this doesn't make, this is two orders of magnitude difference. But if you think about it, it's sort of, an error is more likely to happen in a big job simply because it's bigger, right? So if you put a, a UE at a random time and uh, a random point in space and time, it's more likely to be the big one. Uh, and this, this problem is known as the inspection paradox. It's sort of a general thing. But the thing is, when I, when I make a slide about this and I talk about this for, for a minute or so, it's obvious you have to pay attention to it, but it's actually really easy to miss. And in fact, uh, I'm not I'm, I'm ashamed to say we actually missed it at one point and thought that the uh, the impact was much lower than you know two orders of magnitude smaller than it really was. So this means that resiliency questions are much more important than, than maybe if you start throwing around average job lengths, you think it's less important than it really is. So that, moving on. What did we actually do in this study? Uh, we had the log of uh, the corrected errors. It was a very good log, actually. These four and a half million errors, we know when they happened, we know which node they happen, happened on. We worked with the DRAM manufacturer and even knew some internal things about where they were in the DIM, which is not something you can get without talking to the manufacturers uh, for various reasons. Uh, and using these CEs and other events and reboots and so on, we predict whether there's going to be a UE happening, right? Uh, this is something we did offline. Obviously, we didn't do any of them. Uh, this and the more intrusive thing, which is then to do some kind of mitigation. We didn't do this in production, of course, but we estimated then if we, if our prediction saw that there would be a UE uh, and we do a checkpointing, what would be the benefit of, of this? Uh, and so for the prediction we used, well, we tried six different ones, Random Forest, all these other ones. The one that was, and in the paper, there's some exploration of this, but the, the best that we found was the, the Random Forest. So for running the prediction, it's quite simple, really. We just run it at some frequency, prediction frequency. I forget actually what the prediction, best prediction frequency it was, was was hourly or something, I, I forget. But some, some prediction frequency that you make a decision, you make a prediction based on observing something in the past. Actually, we observed everything in the past up to that point. And then you make a prediction on an upcoming window, right? Is there going to be a UE or there's not going to be a UE in the next, I don't know, in the next hour, let's say. Uh, and this repeats some of the things I said before, the features that we use to make the prediction, how many CEs have you seen, how many UEs, probably none, but maybe some, uh, UE warnings. I think this was warnings to do with temperatures getting high or something, I, I forget the details, uh, but some warnings, what's a manufacturer, blah, blah, inf static information about the DIM, uh, also aggregated across the socket or the node and whether there's been reboot. So this information all comes into the, the random forest classifier. And the output I already said is yes or no, is there gonna be one? Uh, internally, of course, well, not in, of course, but internally, it's actually a probability well, not really a probability. It's um, it's some confidence number between zero and one as to whether there's going to be a UE, and then there's 
just a decision threshold that's set, which is if it's bigger than this number, you say yes, otherwise no, right? Uh, and if you look at how, so at the moment we're following a sort of normal path. We, go, we got some problem, we're gonna apply machine learning uh, methods to try to, um, to deal with this. So uh, I guess you're familiar with true and po false positives, um, true or false, depending on whether you're right or wrong and positive, depending on uh, whether you predict, you predict yes or no, in this case, predicting a UE or not a UE. Uh, and then following normal methodology, you just normally uh, evaluate this using typical metrics, something like recall or precision. So recall is of all the positives, in our case of all the UEs, uh, what proportion did you predict, right? And precision is of all the ones that you predicted, which may or not have been correct, uh, how many, what proportion of them were, were correct? And these metrics are, uh, are okay, but for our problem, the, the first one uh, completely ignores the, uh, the false positives which are when you do a mitigation, which is not, not negligible in terms of cost, uh, when you didn't need to, and you could easily have a method that does loads and loads and loads of them incurring costs pointlessly. So recall uh, is not great because of this. And in general, both of them are just sort of mixing up diverse outcomes. And we have a huge difference in cost between a false negative, which is when you have a UE, but you didn't predict it, you didn't do anything about it, and now you've lost all your compute time, which can be a huge amount of cost. And maybe some of the other outcomes that are very low in terms of cost. So the the way, basically, in the paper, of course, we did, we quoted these metrics, and I'll, I'll show some in a moment. But the what we really advocate is if you're gonna do some study like this, you really need to talk in terms of what's important, right? Which is, uh, in our case, the node hours that are lost or would have been lost uh, because of a UE. And I won't, I mean, these, these equations are not that complicated really, but it's the difference between what the cost would have been uh, without the prediction minus the cost width. And this depends on <clears throat> how many, in the first case, you're not doing a prediction anyway. So it's just a number of UEs times the cost of them. Otherwise you you have some mitigations and you have the unpredicted costs plus, plus the cost of course of the prediction method itself. Of course, we didn't get that. Uh, and then when we put some numbers into this, we looking at the literature checkpointing uh, is two minutes, or you could argue with this, but the numbers are there anyway. You could you could try um, changing this, but this is um, this is um, from the literature. UE cost. Uh, we uh, gave some numbers. You have to remember the impact of the skew that I talked about them in the beginning. But if you know your system, uh, somebody reading this could kind of say okay my average cost is 50 node hours average, not average size of job but whatever the, with the skew and of course the real job distribution from Marinosh and four and then the prediction methods um well this is the cost of the prediction method is the total of everything training predicting checking your banks processing data and so on so <clears throat> there's some results saying that with the Marinostrum run, we could save 40,000 node hours per year, I think that was. Uh, and with the smaller jobs, uh, of course, it depends on the size of the job, right? Uh, then this was, I said that there's a decision threshold internally that is a knob that you could choose. It was more or less the aggressiveness knob, right? So how aggressive is your prediction? The prediction itself, you tune this decision threshold and uh, if it's really low, you predict all the, the UE, well, and actually not all the UEs, right? Because I said earlier that there were 67 UEs. Uh, so even if you predict always, that means always if there's been a preceding event and 
some of them, the UEs just come out of nowhere in that there's a node with, without even any CEs for a long time and then a UE. So there's not really much chance of that being predicted. Uh, so the best is about 40 something UEs predicted for us. If you, you panic as soon as you see anything and, uh, and predict a UE, uh, or of course you put it the other side uh, and you don't predict anything. But then if you look at the number of mitigations you're doing, if you panic every time you see something, then you're going to do an enormous number of mitigations, right? So there's a, obviously a knob to tune that. And then you can look at, okay, I know my system, I know my job distribution, I know what the average UE cost is more or less. Uh, and then I guess you would do some offline thing to try and figure out what your threshold could be. We're looking now at dynamic systems to in future work. Uh, but in this study, we we just did it statically, right? Depending on if your UE cost is really low, then there's no point in really even doing any mitigations. And if your UE cost, because your jobs are huge, are high, then probably you need to predict, you need to um, do the um, mitigation much more commonly, much more frequently. And then uh, what was this? This is then, so the, the figure, what I showed just now in the first plot was, uh, how the prediction algorithm fares, right? But to really evaluate it, as I said, with the cost benefit analysis, it depends on what kind of jobs you're running on it. On, on it. So if you look at in the bottom right with the Marinostrum distribution, you can see that actually quite a lowish decision threshold is is the one that gives the best node hours, right? Whereas in the top left is the other way around, of course, because the jobs are smaller, right? And we got the data here for different scenarios. Uh, and this maybe this slide does a lot of stuff here, but it's trying to say uh, that this kind of decision, which is really important for evaluating it and for even making use of it, you have to do the cost benefit calculation. If you try and do it in terms of recall and, and precision, which we have the two left-hand plots of what you would know if you knew recall and prediction. You're going to change your decision decision threshold, and this is your recall precision. Okay, what do I do? Uh, then, well, what you do depends on what your UE cost is, right? And it's going to be totally different between 50 node hours and 500 node hours, which were just two points I took, right? So uh, that's why this paper sort of says many times right uh, and to to evaluate this kind of thing in terms of cost benefit and that we encourage future authors working in this field to do cost benefit otherwise you run the risk of publishing something that is all great in theory but maybe isn't so useful for for real uh hang on i've got two versions of the same slide okay uh, i think i've come to the end of the study uh, I just wanted to mention one other thing, which is uh, as an outcome of Eurex, uh, uh, we set up uh, European HPC resiliency or resilience initiative, uh, along with many other projects listed on the left hand side. There's a website. Uh, oh, it's very tiny, but you can see the the URL is resilienthpc.eu, right? Uh, and if you go to that uh, website, the URL is a bit easier to see here. Um, there's a, a document you can download that um, goes through. So in this talk, I've, I spoke about this one study. Of course, in Eurex, uh, there were uh, several other activities to do with resilience and a whole co-design exercise in terms of what resilience should be put into the Eurex prototypes. Uh, some of the analysis that we did to support this uh, was expanded uh, and uh, put into this freely uh, downloadable document that basically discusses what aspects of resiliency uh, should um, should be put into production systems. Um, so it's something that's, I think, um, useful for other projects to look at. Uh, it was 
I think it's an important thing uh, to have this kind of document and it was kind of missing and that says it's useful for the for the community. So I'm basically done. Uh, this is just conclusions. We remember we, we use this random forest predictor on two years of production data for Marinostrum. We uh, get good savings in terms of the lost compute time, more than half of it actually, 57%. Uh, good. Oh, that previous slide down when it was 40k was for the whole run because it's 20k, 21k node hours per, per year. Depends, of course, on the system workload. That's why you have to do the cost benefit analysis. Uh, the code is open source, I said, and the publication is there. So do we, do we have any questions? If you guys want to use the put your hand up tool for questions, um, if you have that available, or enter them into the Q and A or the chat. So it's, it's convenient for me if maybe if Peter, you read out any questions if there are any, because then I can carry on sharing the screen. I'm keeping my uh, eye out for some, Paul. I haven't seen any yet. Otherwise, I suggest maybe we move to the next presentation. And if you think of any questions, of course, put it in the chat, and we have a discussion session uh, of thirty minutes at the end of the. The, the workshop. Indeed. So the the next speaker is uh, Nikos Christos from Forth, who will talk about the network. Hi, so, sorry. Uh, hi. Good morning, everybody. So let me share my screen. Yeah, very good. I have it already. So hi, my name is Nikos Kisos. I'm I work at Forth. I'm going to present you uh, the Slim RDMA a work about the Slim RDMA transport hardware transport uh, with advanced congestion management and resiliency hopefully features that we de developed in and developed in EuroExa. This RDMA transport was first developed in Nexus, but we further developed and uh, uh, introduced new features in EuroExa. I'm going to be talking about this network interface, right? Which causes this RDMA transport in this case? Sorry. So I cannot um, move my screen. Okay. So as we move to Exascale, and like actually a couple of years back, because now we're supposed to be there, we platform providers should realize that the Exascale and HPC, uh, Exascale HPC and big data platforms converge because they, they host, uh, they both host uh, many compute nodes, right? And uh, for economic reasons, it makes sense to host both kind of workloads in these platforms. Now the workloads that these platforms host, actually they are this high fidelity HPC, the exascale type, and also big data analytics. And uh, in the data center world, data center world, we also have this uh, flavor of more abstractions, layers, at times, virtualization, which uh, help uh, to administrate and you know make more money out of these platforms because you host more users, etc. And all these uh, applications and uh, runtimes, abstractions, virtualization features, they all rely on uh, CPU cycles, which gradually are becoming more and more valuable because processors are due to technology scaling issues are becoming slimmer, let's say, right? So the solution, I mean, a general solution, the, the, the path that it seems to be followed is, uh, and we're also following in EuroExa, is that we use, uh, there are many, there are accelerators throughout the system and we want to use them and we want to use this distributed processing power throughout the cluster to, to perform our tasks, right? Uh, essentially, this requires faster networks, which can also become a bottleneck because you know we all we always need to move data to and from uh, from memory to memory to to and from distributed accelerators. And uh, one uh, thing is that as these accelerators become fatter and more capable, like a commodity GPU can can provide the tens of teraflops, they need uh, data to to manipulate. And while networks are only running, let's say at 100 gigabit per second. So in this sense, uh, we could only provide, let's say, I don't know what it is, it one bit per per flop. No, per per would that be one bit per flop? Even less than one bit per flop, actually. In, in this uh, in this case, but 
less actually. So as networks become fast, uh, as we need the fast network, what's the problem with uh, fast networks? We, we have a, a processor a co with many cores and it needs to drive a, a gigabit network is that uh, networks also consume uh, cycles. They also need processing power, right? So software transforms like Ethernet networks are too expensive in this regime because TCP Ethernet, in order to transmit data, it needs to consume, it needs to, to occupy the processor, right? So there is a rule of thumb saying that for, any, for every gigabit per second of network bandwidth, we need to consume one gigahertz of uh, computing power, which means essentially one uh, core, more or less, right? And this becomes even more demanding as we have more virtualization and programmability in the network. So the main idea that we follow actually is that in this uh, work is that we need to rethink the end-to-end -end argument which places all the processing at the end nodes and the network is done, etc. So essentially now we move, we need to offload the functions which traditionally were handled in the at the edges. We, we need to handle them in the network. And this, uh, these functions of course are are many others, but one of, uh, two of them are reliable transport, like the TCP transport, and the congestion management, which typically typically runs on the edges. We need to move them on the network, and this is what uh, this work, this talk is all about. So I'm going to present you the network interface that we have been designing at Port uh, during the Euro uh, Exanist and EuroX projects, which provide user level, microsecond level, micro so micro second level communication, which is crucial, especially for uh, HPC, right? And uh, does that using a, a hardware RDMA engine plus a packetizer mailbox features that you need for PIGAS, right? And uh, in, in EuroExa, we, we further advanced this uh, network interface, this transport, this uh, hardware transport with uh, improved resiliency plus, uh, plus uh, a workload protection uh, like uh, isolate workload isolation which is a congestion management thing so when you have many if you if you have many data in the network and you don't have the tcp to do you the good that it does uh, to throttle down sources you can have congestion situations so what we did what we do we had congestion and resiliency in the network and uh, especially the congestion management is a topic which is key interest of, for, for Exascale interconnect providers. Traditionally, Exascale interconnects actually most hardware interconnects do not provide a hardware level condition management. And this is this is becoming crucial. Now when Cray, Melanox and Bull, they are all searching for this kind of solution. So I'm now I'm gonna sort of uh, overview the RDMA, how it works. I mean, not in too many details, but just to give you a flavor. So what we do, uh, the RDMA it's a hardware thing which provides the what it provides to users is zero copy from user measure memory to user memory from a one node to a remote node etc the users do not only the users which are the programs now and the cores that host them do only issue transfers and port the, their status they don't have to do many more things they are not busy processors are not busy during the transfer um, we use global virtual addresses to, under, to identify transfer endpoints as most RDMA transports do today. And we also have programmable completion notifications at the receiver. So when a transfer finishes, there is some notification boom at the receiver saying, okay, you have some new data there, et cetera. These are programmable. Now uh, let's say into a more functional view here on the right we see that rdma transfer it's a many megabyte or gigabyte thing from which needs to be transferred from one memory to another we we split them into blocks okay for management reason for internal reasons right and also for reliability reasons i will, I will talk about that later and these blocks then are then further uh, cut into packets which are sent through the network uh, in Eurexa and Texan, uh, actually, the, the, the actual interconnect inside the network is uh, the switches, the routers, actually, are, uh, are, are, are the Appenet network, which is uh, from a partner to this project, SINFN, right? So the packets are routed to their destinations through this uh, Appenet network. Okay, now this is becoming a bit uh, hardware, but it's not done. Please don't worry, I will guide you through. So I'm going to talk about, uh, let's say, to give an outline of the, of the implementation, right? Just a brief outline. So you have uh, on the top, you have the course, which is you, which want to do RDMA, to issue RDMA. 
right? And this can be processes or even accelerators can use the network, right? And uh, and so you may have writes from local processors from the top, and you also have remote reads. We actually remote reads which when a user wants to read something from my day from my memory. Where, where is my memory here on the left? It is a remote read request, right? So all of these things go into this network processor, which I'm gonna coprocessor actually, which I'm gonna briefly outline. So this network coprocessor is a is a core which does some simple things, right? It's not a, it's not a it's not a fat core. Actually, what it does, it uh, it can host thousands of active transfers, so you may have outstanding many transfers here, and it schedules among them. It segments these transfers, as I talked before, into blocks, 16 kilobyte blocks, and issues them actually to the hardware. Here is the hardware. This is the hardware thing mostly. Okay, sorry, this was mistake, my mistake. And uh, it also this network processor handles end-to-end -end flow control. I'm gonna no, like uh, getting acknowledgements and issuing more blocks, let's say, from a transfer as acknowledgements come come in. And actually, it's also re responsible to retransmit failed blocks. So okay, we'll talk about that. All right, it does all these functions. This coprocessor is uh, slow. It's not hardware. It doesn't run at hardware speed, of course, but it's not busy for every packet. It's only busy for every block, let's say, for every block time. So this gives it more time to do what it does, right? Now, the hardware engine, which is the bottom thing here, it's quite simple. It's a simple data path, right? Uh, it has a few pipeline stages. We use the system MMU. I'm going to briefly talk about that, which is present in many processors. And uh, it does packet by packet scheduling. It schedules, uh, so here, actually here you can have many blocks outstanding, which are is, have been issued by the network coprocessor. There is a sum scheduler, right? Which arbitrates among these packets and issues uh, among these blocks and issues packets to the network. It's quite simple, this hardware and uh, can run really fast. Now regarding resiliency, and this comes again uh, to the coprocessor, we have selective, uh, we support something like selective retransmission. So as an RDMA transfer, as I talked before, has been has been uh, split into blocks. Um, some of uh, the, the network processor issues one block like this one, it waits for an acknowledgement, right? Or it can, uh, if this acknowledgement does not come in time, there will be a timeout and the block will be reissued. So we have some, some sort of selective retransmission. When the, some, something fails, we don't retransmit the entire transfer, but only the failed block. Of course, we can also handle negative. Uh, we also receive negative acknowledgements, which actually expedite the retransmission. And all this happens without this retransmission happen all, all uh, sort of in hardware without any software intervention, without involving the main cost. Now, I will make a short description or comparison with Infinity, but no, okay, it's not, uh, they're not at the same level of uh, development, but of course, just uh, the design points, right? So in our case, we have a hardware transfer, which is which can be tightly, which is designed in order to be tightly coupled with the processors, right? It can it can it can even be designed with the same uh, chip. Actually, in our platforms, it's uh, it runs on an FPGA next to the processor, right? So it's uh, it's a very small thing. Traditionally, uh, uh, RNICs, which are infiniband like, etc., they 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 are they are, they are they occupy PCI NIC, right? They're quite bulky, actually, if you see them. And they, 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 they are there. And they're bulky, actually, because they need to host a, a big TLB translation lookup table, right? So whereas here, in our case, we leverage the system MMU, the users issue transfers, and these transfers have virtual addresses. And in order to access memory, we pass them to, we, we pass these virtual addresses through the system MMU, and there we make the translation. The system MMU, right? Uh, has a small TLB of its own, but actually, there can be there can be it can handle also the case where this page is not uh, here. It's not in it's not in this uh, system MMU uh, TLB, so it has a page table worker in order to go to the main memory and get the translation from the from the uh, from the page table, right? And. Um, Whereas here on the bottom, all the uh, all the transfer, all the mappings have been transferred to the T the TLB inside the NIC. Uh, 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 
the main difference is here is that here we can have a page fold, right? In our case, we can handle page folds. We, we can issue an RDMA transfer and the pages, because we don't need, to, we do not pin them in memory. They can, they can, uh, when there is access to, when we try, try to make the translation from virtual address to physical address, we can find that the page is not in the memory, right? And we can, we can have a page fold here. Whereas traditionally, this is not the case. Traditionally, I mean within fin, but uh, but pinning. So in our case, we do not need to pin pages, which is means lower latency and sleep simpler for programmer, right? And whereas in infinibat, we need to pin pages, which is a huge overhead uh, for memory and for the programmer to 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 maintain that all pages are pinned. Of course, when we have in our case, we can have uh, page folds. So here is a, the source, here is the destination, the source. Issues a transfer, right? So when it comes to destination, it wants to be written in memory. There's when when there is the translation from the system MMU, the I MMU, it may find that the page is not in memory. So in this case, okay, we have a page fault. This is see, this thing does not happen with Infiniband today, at least up to some years back. <laughs> I don't know what happens today. And in this case, what happens in our case, we have some system software that brings in the, 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 the page, the missing page into memory, and then makes a request to the source to retransmit the missing block, right? So we, we leverage the network interface resiliency feature in order to retransmit the missing block and handle uh, page faults, right? Of course, when we have a when we have a page fault and we have this overhead, we may bring in more pages because we already went to, you know, the, the, we cannot, we, we, we already have some big latency, so we can leverage this opportunity to bring in more pages, right? Uh, in a, so, so as to avoid future page faults. But another in, interesting thing is that we can have overlap. So you may start your transfer and not have the pages here, right? And uh, instead of bringing them in memory and then launch the transfer, let's say, which, put these things in sequence, we can, what we can do is then, is we can start the transfer, have a page fold, right? Bring in all pages. And while we bring in those pages, the transfer can, all, can overlap. The, so we can overlap the transfer with the page in of all pages, which is something interesting. We're gonna be showing this here. So here we have the transfer size and here we have the latency in microseconds, right? So here's the ideal case where we don't have any page uh, faults, right? But we didn't actually need to pin anything. We didn't anything. The pages were all, were all in memory before uh, doing the experiment. So this is the ideal case. This is the case where we pin pages before prior to the transfer. And here is the, the case where we page in, uh, we, start the, we start the transfer without the memories being into, without the pages being into memory. So we, we encounter page faults and we resolve them in hardware. As you can see, we're worse than the ideal case. Of course, pinning is also worse than the ideal case. Uh, we're also slightly worse than the <laughs> pinning case for up to a threshold, but as the transfer size increases, we are even better than pinning because in this case, we, we, we don't take the overhead of to pin pages pri prior to the transfer, but we can overlap bringing in pages while the transfer is ongoing. So for large transfers, it seems that we have a benefit here. Okay. Actually, in uh, other situations, we run uh, uh, HPC LAMPS applications with having pages uh, pinned or not, and the, the performance was unaffected by when we handle them page faults in the network. Uh, yeah, okay, this work actually has been presented in a previous work of ours in uh, Knox 2020. Part was the name of this presentation, of this paper. Now I'm gonna briefly talk about the hardware congestion management. I'm gonna be finishing soon. So RDMA, I mean, RDMA, you know, when you do RDMA, you bypass the kernel, you bypass the TCP, you bypass everything. So you, the RDMA simply throws packets into the network. This is the traditional thing. And of course, you may have some flow control here, blah, blah, and many things in order to prevent buffer overflows, but nothing more than that uh, traditionally. So what happens with congestion? And this is this is one thing that uh, we need to we want to handle in hardware, and this is something that uh, also other, uh, as I said before, uh, network providers uh, try to handle into the network. So okay, uh, so this is the RDMA send engine that I talked to you before. It uh, blindly injects packets into the network. 
Again, this is here, but we, here we have uh, we have uh, augmented it with several structures in order to perform congestion management. Okay, the, this structure Actually, that we have here, it's actually something on the links. For every link, we have a contention point, which actually is capable to, to monitor the fair share of each flow inside the network. Okay, this seems very difficult, but actually, it's designed. This protocol is designed to, in order to be quite simple and efficient. It relies on something like a system-level hardware synchronizer, which brings, which gives pulses to every link, which are synchronous. Synchronous, semi -synchronous, synchronous. These pulses are, are not uh, nanoscale range. They are many tens of microseconds. So for every tens of my, some tens of microseconds, we have a pulse here, 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 which gives, uh, which synchronizes these contention points inside the network. And we actually have built the build the hardware for that in the, the XNS and UX prototype. And this contention point, actually, what it does is that, as I said before, it mean it, it can tell. What is the fair share of the flow inside this link? Uh, it's slightly more complicated than that, but uh, I will skip that. Now, what it happens actually, and we also have a, at the at the sources, we also have a priority queue, which maintains, uh, which actually is capable to space out packets according to this fair share. What well, actually what it happens is when we have an RDMA trans transfer, we the source is notified about the worst case fair share along each path. So here we may have, the, the, your fair share might be 10 gigabps. Here you can, can be 10, uh, five gigabps, but here it can be two gigabps. So the source will be notified that its fair share is two gigabps. And this queue here, priority queue, which is a hardware structure, uh, it, uh, it can throw to space out packets according to this um, 10 gigabps, uh, two gigabps fair share of this flow. Now, uh, we have performed some experiments in, um, previously, initially we did them in simulation in NOx 2018, sorry. And, uh, okay, with traditional benchmarks or let's say micro benchmarks where you have many nodes sent to one node and some interesting things happen. Actually, one of these interesting things is traditionally in, uh, in traditionally, typically in, uh, congestion management, you have some victim flows which are not contributing to congestion, but they are affected by that. And you have the congested flows which are contributing to congestion. They are all going to some nodes, let's say. But now in, uh, in Eurexa, we actually tested them in, uh, the, in a hardware platform, multi in, in the real implementation before it was only simulation, the hardware implementation we tested here. So, okay, these are the, this is the test bed one or actually of uh, uh, X, uh, Eurexa which has this QFTB, which are hardware, which are, which actually each QFTB is, a, let's say, it's a board with four FPGAs, which each FPGA has four processors, and each FPGA has its own network interface. So you have a network interface here, a network interface here, a network interface here, and of course you have the, the interconnect, which is, uh, as in your it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, relate, it's, uh, it's INFN interconnect, uh, which uh, Appenet interconnect, which interconnects all these things. Right. So we test this uh, scenario here again uh, in this hardware platform. And uh, here are the results, which are the results from the platform, as I said before. So here is without congestion management. As I said before, okay, now we please let's give some attention to the colors. This is the victim flow. This All these are congested flows. They are going to the same destination and they congest some link. So here we have the time of the experiment and here we have the, the rate of the flows. The victim flow, you cannot see it. It's, it has a, a low bandwidth here, the victim flow, it suffers. It suffers needless, needlessly, let's say it should be, its bandwidth should be much higher. Now, another interesting thing is that some congested flows, this one for instance, takes more bandwidth than the less because it's closer to the destination. This is related to the parking lot problem. In, traditionally in uh, TCP and other interconnects, you can have this unfair situation where flows more close to the to the, to the link which is congested get more bandwidth. So this is what happens here without congestion management. And uh, as you see, the congested link is highly utilized. It's a, at peak uh, rate. Actually, this is the peak rate that it can get, but we have all these bad things happening underneath. So with congestion management uh, that I introduced before, we have a much better situation. Again, we have the time. 
here is the victim flow, which now, as you see, it can breathe quite well. It, uh, from two gigabits, it now gets 11 gigabit PS per second, actually. I'm, I'm not paying attention much to the numbers. I'm giving you the trend, right? Which is what we wanted. And actually all the congested flows get the fair share of the bandwidth, right? So this is quite good, uh, as I said. That doesn't depend on the traffic pattern orientation, what the bandwidth of the flow should be. All right, uh, this was about it. Uh, now we we further up now in a, in a follow up project in Red Sea, which will start uh, next month. We are adapting this congestion management for. Uh, we want to exploit it with Bull and BXI. We want to. We would like to. I mean, we will study it further, and we would like it to be, let's say, implemented in Bull Bull's BXI Atos network. So, for a summary. So, sorry, it took some time. Uh, networks need to resiliently handle dynamic workloads. Okay, resiliency is one feature, right? That we, that's a key feature for, for interconnects uh, and systems in general, right? So these networks need to provide low latency, small uh, variance, latency variance, tail scale, etc. And we need to provide the, in hardware as it gets slowly by slowly more more in hardware, we need to provide workload isolation, protection, things that relate to congestion management. And all of this without any processor overhead. So in EuroExa and TechSanet, we evolved a custom network interface a lot to these guidelines, searching for interesting uh, solutions. And actually implementing, we did that in, in the past, you know, with simulations, etc. but now we're implementing them in FPGA clusters, which is a really good thing. It gives us a good opportunity to run real applications and test them in uh, real test cases. And this is what we do in this project. And actually we have seen in previous results that we are five times better when running MPI apps, let's say better than 10 gigabit ethernet. Is, I mean, the, these are my results from, uh, application partners that we have. And uh, okay, as I said before, we'll further exploit and uh, refine the solutions in uh, Red Sea and for BXI and low power risk five, risk of five processors and accelerator. So that was all from my side. Thank you for your attendance. And uh, okay, this was not only my work, of course, this is a work of a big team at Force that works in X, that worked in Exonest and your X Interconnect, which is head by Manolis, head here is Manolis Catavens and main contributor. You can see some main contributors here. And thank you. Uh, any questions? Okay, if not, uh, I don't know, Peter, uh, should I, we move on to? Yes, let's Manolis. move on to, to Manolis. Okay, uh, I will shortly introduce Manolis. Manolis is a colleague of mine, so Manolis, please forgive me. Manolis is a, is a researcher at Ford working on MPI, uh, software applications and many other things uh, like uh, resiliency, I don't know, uh, fault tolerance, uh, uh, he's, a, he's originally a network guy, so I'd like him. So please, Manolis, please go ahead. Thank you. Hello, all. Thank you, Nico. So I try to share my screen. Uh, <clears throat> okay, I'm trying to get the screen. This one. I think you can see my screen now, right? Okay. So can everybody see my screen? Uh, I can see it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I'm my manager Pumidis. I am affiliated with Ford. Uh, the talk, my talk today is titled Efficient Hardware Assisted MPI Implementation in the Eurexa Project. And uh, what I'm actually going to talk about is the MPI environment that we offer in the UEXA. That is an extension of the uh, MPI environment that we already had in, uh, within the uh, EXANF project. So first, I will uh, present a, a, a quick presentation of the development tested, uh, and then the hardware blocks that we used to, for the MPI implementation, an overview of the MPI implementation, 
Um, then I'm going to present uh, a, a quick view of the read-based protocol as we had it in the XNS project, in, and then the new write-based protocol that we are actually developing and uh, trying and evaluating within the UEFSA project. Uh, some very, very preliminary results of the latest days uh, regarding the performance comparison of the read versus the write-based protocol, and some notes about our ongoing and uh, future work finally. So the development tester that we used is this uh, liquid-cooled prototype uh, initially developed within the XNS project, which is maintained at port. Uh, it consists of eight mezzanines with four QFTBs per mezzanine. There are four shocks per QFTB. And as far as the interconnect is concerned, for the intra-QFTB case, for the intra-QFTB traffic, we had an XNet with an all-to-all -all connectivity. And for the inter-QFTB and the inter-mezzanine case, again, there is an Exanet uh, connectivity uh, in a 3D torus uh, arranged on a 4x2x4 uh, by by uh, topology. Um, and far as the hardware blocks that we used and the, that we depend on for developing the MPI environment, uh, for data movers, we have used this DMA engine that uh, Nikos provided uh, quite... Uh, quite um, enough details in the previous talk. We use this DMA, this custom DMA engine developed at Ford to convey the payload data. And uh, some of the features that we exploit is that it is able to handle transfers between any local and uh, any virtual uh, remote address. Uh, it also supports multiple virtual interfaces. And uh, the interesting feature also is that we can have a delivery of completion notification to the remote site so that the peer process can know that the transfer is complete. Uh, Two other hardware blocks that we use are uh, the packetizer and the mailbox, and uh, we use them to convey the control data. Uh, and the main feature is that we can have an atomic low, less, uh, low latency message delivery. <coughs> and we use them to convey messages that are up to 56 bytes. And also, we should also know that uh, we can have user level access to these hardware blocks. Uh, as also Nikos described uh, previously in uh, detail, we also have a dependence on the SMMU for handling the translation of uh, virtual to physical addresses. Uh, and, uh, the MPI environment that we offer has three, uh, has three main entities. The first entity is a custom library for point-to-point -point primitives. And what it actually does is it intercepts uh, most of the point-to-point -point primitives provisioned by the MPI standard and then implements them. Uh, and this is the library that implements either the read or write based protocol. So this library implements uh, the blocking point to point primitives and unblocking ones. We have not implemented yet the persistent requests. Um, so the second entity is a custom library again that implements uh, collective primitives. And we use these uh, algorithms and the switching points for changing algorithms, uh, the same as in the case of the MP3.2.1 library. Uh, and finally, the third entity for, uh, needed for our MPI environment is a modified and pitch library. Uh, and the modifications that we, we need to export the communication context ID, a 16-bit uh, identifier that identifies the context, which is part of the message envelope. And we want this, mod this modified and pitch library to handle primitives that we do not implement in the information to libraries. Uh, for example, the persistent uh, communication requests that I said. And uh, for example, the non-blocking uh, collective printings that we do not implement in the second library. Uh, and the approach that we followed from the beginning for uh, providing this MPI environment is a uh, hardware and software co-design. Uh, we tried for uh, all the libraries to take advantage of uh, the hardware features that we have. And as we developed the library, we required some features that were uh, offered by the network interface or uh, this network interface got teams to provide the appropriate, the appropriate features. One example is that we can have a polling mode for the mode instead of the interrupt. Uh, also, we needed to fix the size of the packetizer atomic message so that it can handle larger messages. And this uh, packetizer message size is needed for the eager protocol. So we can exploit uh, the low latency for larger messages. We wanted to have a DMA notification delivery so that the remote address can know in a virtual address that this peer provides that the transfer is complete. Uh, we have also a version of an accelerator for the OLED primitive that is part of the network interface. And we have seen quite encouraging results from this accelerator. 
So let me provide first a very quick overview of the read-based protocol the, that we had already in the XNS, and then we compare against in the XNS and the UX project. It is center initiated. Uh, it supports both the long and the inget protocol. For the control path, again, we use the packetizer as the sender and the mailbox is the recipient of the message. And for the payload, for the actual data, we use the DMA engine. Uh, and this is a timing diagram. You will see for the rest of my talk, similar diagrams. Uh, and so let me introduce as the first slide some common notations. Uh, this T1 here, small T is denoting uh, the time. Capital T denotes the tag. So at T1, we have a send, a posted send. So this uh, it uses the packetizer to send a request to send to the receiver. Uh, at, T3, at, T3, at, T3, at T3, later on, the corresponding the matching receive is posted. So the receiver sends the clear to send. And then we have the actual DMA transfer with the notification delivery. Now, uh, since this, uh, for the case of the Eager protocol, this RDMA write is initiated from the side of the receiver. So the receiver sends a message to start the DMA engine at the sender. So then the sender needs, needs a way to know that this transfer is complete, that the receiver has received the notification. So at T7, uh, the exchange is finalized with the, with the acknowledgement from the side of the receiver. And uh, this is the case of the Eager protocol. Uh, at T1, the send is posted. Uh, the, we assume here that D is the data, that the data fit within the packetizer. So it, uh, the sender packs, packs the envelope uh, with the data for the, to a single message and sends the corresponding message to the receiver. And when the receiver, when the corresponding receive is posted, uh, the matching is complete. And so the receiver can continue its progress. So, uh, the motivation for the right uh, for the right based protocol is the scenario depicted in this figure. Assume here that the receiver posts the corresponding match and receive early enough. So at T1, we have the receive posted by the receiver, but now the receiver has to wait until the corresponding request to send is posted by the sender. So this uh, comes a bit later on that T2. So the receiver has to wait for this interval. Although he has arrived at his receive, he has to wait until he receives the request to send. And so the main idea that existed uh, was if the receiver uh, comes early enough, why not send a ready to receive notification to the sender uh, so that we can initiate this exchange a bit faster. But however, this brings some complications that I'm going to show in the next slides. Let's examine the right based protocol. It is the long protocol case. Uh, and the case when the sender comes earlier than the receiver, so this is quite similar with the read-based. At T1, we have the sender. He posts, he has not received any ready to receive. So he posts uh, the request to send to the sender, to the receiver, which comes at T2. At TAF3, the receiver posts the matching send. It matches against the entry that received. He sends the clear to send. And then the sender is able to unblock his progress, send the data, send the data through an RDMA write, send the notification to the receiver. And now since the DMA engine is started from the sender, from the side of the sender, we do not need to have a knockback. So the sender knows that the, the DMA has finalized. He has initiated the DMA transfer. So he knows that the DMA transfer finished. And uh, when the receiver receives the notification here, he unblocks progress and goes on. Now, uh, let's see the case where uh, the receiver is posted early. We do not have the MPI in the source, which is a source of complication. So at T1, we have the receiver which is posted early, uh, and the receiver posts the, the ready to receive to the sender. So it is a receiver initiated, and then the receiver blocks until he receives either an envelope or a request to send. Uh, at the time that T1, the receiver posts the corresponding uh, receive, he does not know from the buffer size that if it is going to fall into the eager or the long protocol, recall that in the receive uh, primitive, you declare buffer capacities. So that's why he blocks for either an envelope or a request to send. So the receiver uh, gets the, the ready to receive at T2. And then at T3, the corresponding send is uh, posted. It is matched against the receive. He needs to send an envelope describing the amount of data that is going to send along with the tag uh, because if the receiver is posted with any tag, the receiver needs to know uh, 
uh, the amount of data posted along uh, with the tag. Uh, then at P4, uh, the receiver matches the envelope with the request, the ready to receive that he posted. Uh, and then without waiting here, the sender after the envelope sends the RDMA right again uh, with a notification. And here is going, we are going to discuss an uh, optimization at the final slide. So again, the long, the right base protocol, long case. Here we have, uh, again, the receive is posted early. However, the receive is posted with the any source. So the receiver does not know which is the sender that is going to match uh, against his receive. So at T1, the receiver is posted early. However, he cannot know which is the matching send. So the receiver blocks waiting for an, R, for an RTS, he sends nothing. At T2, uh, so in this case, uh, the exchange is sender initiated. When at T2, when the sender arrives, he posts the request to send, which is matched at the receiver. He sends back the clear to send. And then the protocol proceeds as in the previous case. So then the interesting point here is that when we see the receive, we have a differentiation. When the receive comes earlier, but comes with an any source, we do not uh, go on, but instead we block. And the most tricky case is the one that is uh, demonstrated in this slide. We have again the long, the long case of the right-based protocol. And uh, the scenario here is that uh, sender and receiver uh, arrive at almost the same time as the corresponding primitives. Let's say that, assume that uh, at exactly P1, the sender posts the send. So since he has not received any ready to receive, he posts the request to send. At T1, again, the receiver does not use any source. He says that here that uh, the matching sender is S, so he knows the sender. Uh, he has not received any request to send, so he posts the ready to receive. So we have the concurrent uh, uh, initiation from both the sender and the receiver at the same time. So here, when the receiver sees the matching, uh, when he receives the request to send, he says that he, uh, the, he matches the, the send, so he sees that it matches the posted receive. Uh, here the receiver uh, sees that the RTR, the red to receive that he receives corresponds to the RTS, so he does not wait for a, uh, for a clear to send. And uh, instead he goes on with the RDMA right, and finally he sends the notification. Uh, and that's all with uh, the long protocol. Now, maybe I'm going over uh, part of the Rager protocol, since we have the same scenarios. Uh, Rager protocol is triggered when the sender needs to send uh, less, less or equal to 56, 56 bytes. Again, we have the scenario with the send that it is posted earlier than the, than the matching received. So he sends the envelope with the data through a packetizer. Uh, and the, a small uh, detail here, the receiver needs to send an, an acknowledgement back. And the reason is uh, because, and this is a, a complication and an extra overhead due to the, to the ready to receive. And the reason we want this act is because if at, uh, at a later point there is another receive posted at the receiver, the receiver is going to send the request to receive here. So the sender is not, uh, without an act, he's not going to be able to know if this request to receive is for the matching send or for a new one. So a deadlock will uh, arise. That's why we need this acknowledgement, and uh, it is an overhead that this early ready to receive brings. Um, in the next case, again, we have a ready to receive posted early without any source. So the receiver uh, advertises his readiness with the ready to receive. Again, it is matched on the sender that finally sends the envelope and the data. So here, the matching at the time at T3, since there is, the sender has received the, re the ready to receive, uh, the, match, the sender is matched, he knows that it is posted by the receiver, so he just sends the envelope and the data, and he unblocks his progress without waiting for an acknowledgement. The third case, again, we have the receiver which is posted early, we have an any source, so the receiver cannot advertise anything, he does not know the source, so he cannot know at whom should he send the advertisement, so he just blocks and waits, and again, uh, when the sender go, arrives at the corresponding send, he sends the envelope with the data. And since he had not received any ready to receive, he needs this acknowledgement back from the receiver. 
And the case is similar. Here is the similar where both the sender and the receiver arrive at the same time at their primitive. The receiver has no any source. He advertises uh, his readiness with the ready to receive. Uh, there is a concurrent envelope plus data on the network. Uh, this ready to receive is used by the sender to match uh, the transfer. So he knows that the, here at T3, the matching is complete. Uh, he has unlocked his progress earlier, and at T3, he's able to clear the state for the, for the send that he has posted. Uh, let me show some very first results comparing the read and the write based protocol. The benchmark uses the OSU latency micro benchmark. Uh, here is a, on the he axis is the message size. We have a focus on large messages. On the y axis, we have the latency. And we can see that uh, uh, for, for large message size, there is a marginal benefit of uh, the right based, of the right based protocol versus the read based. And uh, at this point, at the, the lower messages, there is uh, for the for the really small messages due to this extra act that we have on the side of the eager protocol, we have a slight degradation. However, we have we are we are already working on uh, uh, an optimization using some utilizing some piggy backing, trying to avoid this extra act. Uh, however, let us uh, let me also note that uh, in this. In this case, we do not expect much of a, a benefit since uh, we do not we do not uh, utilize many times. We do not utilize very often this fast case of when uh, the receiver is posted early, and this is the case where we expect to see the benefit, uh, which means that uh, we, we expect to see larger benefit uh, in real applications uh, that use collectives, and in the cases that the receiver is posted early, uh, where we, we would normally wait with the read-based protocol. Some uh, ongoing work. Uh, we have uh, uh, we, we go so there is a typo here, a typo here. We are working to to uh, advance the performance evaluation using real applications instead of micro benchmarks. Uh, and as I already said, this is the case where we um, expect to see larger benefit. Uh, Currently, we have, we have not supported the non-contiguous data types. So the first approach is uh, that we're working with is to pack and unpack them. The same approach that we had in the read-based protocol. And we are thinking of an optimization that is going to exploit uh, features of the DNA engine. Uh, we are working in, uh, to eliminate an extra envelope that I showed in the long protocol. And uh, we have in mind some extensions. If we remove some limitations of the MPA standard, we have in mind some extensions that we could be interested in. Uh, to explore um, as part of our future work. Uh, and this one finalizes my talk. Well, thank you for your attention. And I'm ready to receive any questions. If there are no questions, then I guess they can be posted in the Q&A section, or I can stop sharing my screen. Uh, and uh, I'll allow for the next speaker, which is uh, Professor John Goodacre, to take over. So, Hi, I'll just uh, share my screen out. One moment, everyone. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Oh, still a bit fairly early in the UK. Uh, so, so a slightly different track uh, for my talk. I'm going to more look at the technology and at a higher level rather than the details of any specific implementation that uh, we've been doing in Manchester or in the project at URX. Uh, so I, I think a number of you have either heard me or seen previous presentations, or if not, you can find them online, where I've described a lot of the challenges of uh, uh, achieving uh, exascale uh, uh, capable systems, but really what I'd sort of summarize is it's all around the efficiency, obviously, because the power is the problem. That leads to the challenges of getting density to be uh, in terms of getting locality and then making sure communication speeds low. You know, I always used to 
you know, share that if you want to move, you know, applications that are using one byte per op, uh, and you consider that uh, moving an exabyte, so there's your exaflop of, of data, five millimeters is five megawatts, and that's regardless, you know, slightly lower in, in, in photonics, but uh, as soon as you're touching a, a typical conductor, that's the kind of thing you're doing. So, you know, just having your memory, you know, 520 uh, millimeters away, you, you, you're almost cracking the, uh, the, the power challenge just by moving your bytes of data around. So locality became a significant problem that we wanted to address. And then as, as you've been hearing in the previous talks, resilience, uh, when you start getting hundreds of thousands of uh, separate nodes needing to work together. So that's all well and good. And obviously there have been examples of uh, significantly scalable systems uh, being published recently or in the last few years or so, or while the project's been running. Uh, that didn't also then consider, and you need to be able to run applications. So, you know, uh, some of the uh, East Israel microcontroller based wide vector machines that we've seen uh, are, are great for running the benchmark, but as we can see, that, that they were fractional utilization. So, we needed to make sure the system could actually run applications as well. And that's why Eurex was a co design application project. But clearly, what we're focusing on in this talk is more the technology. So as you, anybody who's been to the eurex.eu website that we've got, we try to highlight the uh, concepts by which we uh, implemented and targeted an awful lot of the work. Uh, the first uh, phrase we use is data fluid processing. This was all around uh, an extension of the more traditional data flow model where we're basically trying at different levels of granularity, not just at the computational level, but also in the programming models and in the way that we attach data uh, to compute and accelerator. So the whole architecture is all around trying to move uh, the ratio between the energy consumed to control what the operation is and the energy required to do the operation. Again, you know, just for those that haven't heard me, the typical superscalar machine spends two thirds or more of its energy trying to work out what to do next than it actually doing it. So literally you know, 70 plus percent was the uh, uh, calculation that was made on a quad issue machine, just trying to work out with the speculation and through the uh, unwinding, et cetera, 70% of energy versus the energy that went into the operation. So clearly, if the data flow model where you're scheduling on the availability of data, where the data is actually presented at the point of use without having to make pre-decisions, whether or not that's within the fabric of an FPGA or whether or not it's in the scheduling of tasks or whether or not it's the fact that you're connecting memories to accelerators directly or the communication, that was all part of the data fluid processing architecture concept uh, being investigated across the consortium. The other side that I mentioned earlier was the density. So clearly the idea of proximity optimized computing was the term that we came up with. The idea that we have to look at keeping things close as possible. So awful lot of work uh, and research and implementation at the moment in terms of interconnects and on how do I continue to scale the number of nodes required in an interconnect, even though the physical silicon in terms of what uh, number of surdes can be fanned out from a particular point can't really go any further. So it's, it's a problem not just of topology, but interconnect starts stretching down into silicon scalability of their mixed signal devices. So again, a very holistic view of what would be required to scale up to the next order of magnitude of nodes. And we'll talk, I'll, I'll look at a little bit of that, but again, a lot of published work already out of URX in terms of what the, uh, the different uh, hybrid interconnect that we've historically called it uh, looks like. But it was all around keeping things close, locality, looking at that data communication problem. That then drove other problems. So as soon as you say everything's got to be close, what you're actually doing is bringing the thermal and compute density uh, significantly higher. And this is where uh, a, a, a section of this talk will look at what we did in the infrastructure to be able to support basically five plus times uh, increase in, in, in thermal density associated with what you can do with compute, all around keeping those wires short, keeping things close, keeping things local, and making sure that, you know, you know you've seen the photographs of the exascale deployment 
sort of data centers where it's half a kilometer plus from one end to the other. The last thing you want to be doing is picking up, you know, nanoseconds worth of communication latency just because that's how long light takes to travel half a kilometer. You know, it starts getting noticeable. Oh, anything over sort of 10, 20 kilometers, it's getting more than you would have seen moving through some computation. And the last part is uh, around the uh, metamodularity, the idea that you know, one, it, we can't rely on one company to have the, or one design to deliver the entire solution statically forever. So you have to look at how you can modularize and change components of it. How do you keep the system in a way that can be uh, altered between the different configurations for different deployment size? Everything's not going to be exascale, but if exascale is going to be cost effective, the technologies have to be reusable. So how do we make a two, a two megawatt data center? How do we uh, build that internally? How do we deploy it if it's only a hundred kilowatt data center versus a 60 megawatt data center? How do we keep that manufacturing uh, flexibility and the uh, technology flexibility to say, oh, here's a really new uh, power efficient three nanometer chip. How do we integrate that into the design without having to, uh, you know, do it, uh, do it themselves through proprietary technologies and form factors. So open standards became quite very important also in that regard. So the system hierarchy, how does the uh, modularity fit? How does the interconnect scale across that? This is really the summary slide for the technology system architecture. So I will talk a little bit next around the node, what were the node concepts in the architecture to sort of start implementing that locality? How do we look at it in the terms of the data fluid processing? How do we keep everything close together on that? And that is actually a uh, Eurex developed node. On. We go and go through physically to the blade. This is where we're starting to see an awful lot of the, the density uh, come through. Uh, obviously, the idea that you can put, uh, you know, if you look at the 200 watts node TDP, putting 16 of those in a 1U server, think about your, which, you know, your, you pick up your Intel 1U servers today, you know, what TDP chip can that do, hold one processor in, okay? So let's be very uh, uh, acknowledging the work that's been done there to be able to support that level of density. Clearly, what we don't want to be doing there is bringing 16 high density, sorry, high bandwidth network connections out of that density. So again, maintaining those locality, giving every node a mesh communication between itself, creating quadrants of quadrants. And then what do you do? So you've now got one blade, it's already got its equivalent of a top level switch in that would be joining 16 traditional nodes together embedded within that blade as well. So again, I'll look at those in a little bit more details and how that is uh, done in the cooling. We're then up to the, the traditional cabinet level deployment. Obviously cabinets are the, the things that get shipped around typically when you want some more capability. So again, we see a union here of the topology and the cooling to be able to get the density up significantly. You know, I, I was looking to deploy some prototype nodes, or not prototype, sorry, emulation nodes previously, and the, the host has said, I've got eight kilowatts per rack, okay? It's not unheard of that they are still single digit, state of the art might be pushing that to 40, we're up over to, at over 100 kilowatts per rack at this point. So again, the level of communication that can happen in there, the level of wiring that would be required using traditional Taurus based networks or a butterfly network. So again, we introduced the next level of a uh, of, of our interconnect where we have the Taurus connecting clusters of eight nodes, sorry, eight blades together. So that's already up at, uh, you know, 16 nodes times eight. So we're already quite high up in the, the node count within the Tauruses. And again, we look at how do we expand that up to where we're going with the exascale. So what we end up with there is a number of choices, actually. You know, what you can see in the little cabinet drawing is uh, you know, four rack uh, group switches, that are a green blob that you see in the middle there. Or actually, since the project started, uh, companies like Mellanox have actually realized that they have a 
backplane technology and the 25 and the 50 terabit switches, and they can start delivering single switches that have 800, 2 gig, 200 gig ports in. So we could actually not use the embedded switches and we could put the, an entire container full of known uh, blades into a single switch. So that obviously has benefits over any torus that you're getting an 800 flat latency interconnect between 800 up to, you know, in that case, 12,000 uh, compute nodes. Okay, so that's a single switch level at that point at the container. Once you've got your container, we're throwing around 200, two megawatts worth of power capability, you know, tens of petaflop level capability in the system and, and hundreds of terabits worth of aggregate bandwidth between those nodes. So uh, but some, in some cases, actually looking at that now as your historical cabinet, people talk about how many hundreds of cabinets are required for exascale. We actually start talking about, we just need to connect about 30 cabinet air, air containers together. So again, switch technologies uh, commercially available today, you can, connect, you can connect 20, 30 containers at 400 gigabits together uh, using an off-the-shelf five grand switch or 10 grand switch. Okay, now obviously you wouldn't use one switch to connect for the uh, 400,000 nodes together, but again, the idea of the deployment specific, the ability to be using what has become uh, commodity innovation led in the ethernet space, and that's the SDN, is software defined networking. So basically we get rid of, we've done work to get rid of all of the complexities of ARP lookups and tables and things that you see in, uh, Ethernet is why you don't use Ethernet for HPC, uh, and we just software define the routes and statically pre-configure those just the way, the same way Infinibem does, but we're using the market leading generically available uh, open flow configurable uh, switches. So the bottom half of the table, the other sort of thing to realize there is as soon as you're not just looking at the fan out of a single known network across a butterfly type network, you can start seeing that the uh, the comms bandwidth in aggregate between your nodes is significantly higher than you would see uh, on a, a centralized topology. So that is obviously a key part. The other innovation we did, and we'll talk about this a little bit more when I describe the node, is the distributed central store. The actual capacity for that then gets distributed between the nodes as well. So the, the advantage there is that you're, you're now not network constrained uh, to a storage system that then delivers you the central store. You create the delivers del the store across the, the same network and the nodes that are providing that storage. And again, you know, in aggregate, if you want to load up your data, you could actually drop multiple network points into your data center and actually be storing or reading your data out at the petabyte per second. So the idea that you could actually multi tenant an exascale machine and people load up and uh, extract data distributed. And again, you're at the 30 gigabit level at one node. So clearly that becomes a very interesting thing. And the architecture could be implemented differently to change those things, but that's what we, we uh, prototyped within the uh, test beds of your Exa. So the compute node, uh, the concept behind the architecture of the compute node it changed a few of the priorities. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, previous uh, papers around you know, compute centric, network centric, data centric, well, any centric kind of computer you want. Uh, I don't think I've heard accelerator centric before, but the idea that your computation is actually the important thing in high performance computing, that's where all your efforts done. So why is your network connected to your host? Obviously, there's been a few papers that have put back networks on, on, on some networks, uh, a, a very popular one within the smaller domain, obviously, is NVLink on the GPUs, the idea that GPUs can now talk directly together because they're the things that need to talk, they're the things that need to get to, to, get to the data. But they're also the things that need to get hold of your memory. So let's make sure your memory is unified, make sure your uh, capacity can be placed on the accelerator so they can then uh, hold the data local. You're not always passing data from the host. And then obviously all the data doesn't live within the host and the accelerator. How do you get it there? We're now saying, where's the network? Where's the storage? And again, 
you need to be able to expose that natively to the accelerator, not just NVLink sharing memory between accelerator between accelerator, but a lot of the paradigms of, you know, I want to be able to talk directly into the memory of another accelerator, or I want to be able to pass data across the interconnect, I want to, etc. Now, obviously, at that point, your host still has the uh, legacy networking requirements that could either go through the higher interface or go directly on a secondary network themselves. But in essence, the concept is around giving the accelerator, the compute part, uh, the key capabilities. Now, clearly, if the acceleration is a vector machine within the host, then you just need to look at something in terms of how do you do uh, uh, get rid of the other overheads associated with hosts to give that vector unit the full capability. Now, obviously, the design that we had, and I'll talk about this next, is that the host could be anything connected to the accelerator across any interface. But uh, what, what one of the key parts, I'll go back to that, that slide in a moment, of, of the work that done in the, the Manchester in this communication was around what can we do about that host to make it a native participant of that uh, accelerated IO interconnect. So in other words, let's look at it in terms of not being a host that's using a PCI type connection that has a car plugged in it uh, to talk to an accelerator. Let's not look at it in terms of how do we integrate within the system on chip or within the microarchitecture, the processor, some other uh, acceleration capability. How do we make it processor native in that uh, enhanced architecture? So obviously on the previous talks, you've heard about the uh, ability for RDMAs to use the, the, cap the, the interconnect capability, the XNet, the idea that, that you can ask a, a DNA engine within the accelerator or around the processor uh, to, to move data, but what you need to always understand is that you need to set up and configure the DMA and that for large packets, the overhead of that is negligible. And, and, and basically, if you're doing large bursts of data, that there's not a problem in setting up an RDMA to go and do the transfers. But what if you have a lot of small packets? What if you're having to update a, a, a weighting, global weighting that is going to be used globally on a system. It's only a small packet, it's a synchronization, it's, a, it's something that needs to get there quickly. And again, the idea that we can do processor native distributed shared memory capabilities is something again that's already been published around. But the idea here, what I'm showing in the pro, in this uh, block diagram of the SOC that I uh, just developed is, we can connect that capability natively into the processor or the SOC interconnect and basically bridge straight onto the network protocol uh, directly from that. And again, how you use that for small packages is, is the area of ongoing research. So this uh, had uh, not only the ability for the global shared memory, but we uh, enhanced the Unimem. So again, if you're a lot familiar with Unimem, there's a lot of uh, information already published around that. But it's basically a, a, pro a memory protocol uh, similar to what was derived uh, in terms of Gen Z. So the idea that you can have a global memory protocol, if you like, for accessing and, and manipulating global memory. Uh, this was one that uh, we allowed and uh, permitted it to be overlaid on top of on-chip interconnects. So the idea that the on-chip interconnect could encode both local and remote addresses. And then the question became, how do I bridge those interfaces out? And you've heard a little bit around how system DMA, system MMUs can do that. But again, what we embedded within the capability of the ASIC was both be able to do that uh, both to and from. So the idea that you, you can have a virtual global address space. So that allows the application to request a section of its virtual memory mapped directly to that global virtual memory. That obviously allows you now to immediately be sharing data structures within that global memory. The other side to the ASIC, and this will, you may ask why, but obviously I think everybody knows there's a memory bottleneck regardless of what you're doing. Uh, because you know whether that is the number of physical interfaces you can put on a chip, or whether or not it's the energy required to move memory. The idea that we need to make that memory interface more efficient has been a, an area of broad research over the years. You, 
you probably heard about the hypermemory cube HMC. You probably know about high bandwidth memory to look at the bandwidth limitations of that. So within the consortium, again, a company called Zero Points have there is a, a technology for memory compression. Uh, this gives to a two to three compression ratio with similar latency costs of what you would have seen if you were jumping between NUMA machines. So the idea that you could effectively double the capacity, double the bandwidth, halve the power for the same bandwidth without having to put the second socket of worth of DIMMs in because a processor can't have an infinite, you know, twice as many uh, DIMMs wrapped around it. So, you know, that's why the, the very big expensive chips are sort of limiting to eight uh, memory interfaces, even though, you know, they are pushing hundreds of cores now behind them. So the the, the, the core to, the core to uh, byte of memory capability is shrinking rapidly while the applications are saying they need one, more than one byte of memory uh, per operation. So clearly the memory compression was a key part of that. That allowed our design to actually look at something uh, which was what if we were to make a computational memory device uh, within that node? So this is where that ASIC that I described uh, was designed for. It was designed to fit underneath a, a, a memory device, a stack, a stacked memory device. So stacked memory devices and energetic standards. These are things that you see uh, when we started the project. We we identified an eight gigabyte device we could use. You can see the part number there. They're they're now hitting sixteen gigabyte devices. Jedic defines it as fifteen by fifteen millimeters. And that is plenty big enough to put a fairly large uh, processor underneath. Okay, and this is what's happening in your embedded device, for example, today. So that device that we chose was four four memory channels. So uh, that obviously was then driven by those yellowy things that are basically the, the the memory subsystems that you saw, and they connect out, effectively doubling the capabilities of those four uh, channels or uh, that we had to the device. The other thing that we did on the device, clearly if now I'm not bringing any of those memory DDR buses out onto the PCB, is I need to then connect to it. So uh, in a similar manner to what H uh, HBM uh, did in terms of bringing a service connected memory protocol to the device, we bring the Unimem protocol to the device over high-speed servers. They are encoded using the uh, Exanet protocol. And then the actual transport layer is uh, about using a, a technology we designed in Manchester called MaxiLink, which allows us to basically use SIRDES bidirectionally, but also expose them both as a memory address and streams. So we have the ability to have streaming uh, between these devices using the enhanced Unimem over MaxiLink transported by URX across those SIRDES. So that's really what the the ASIC design of, of the uh, or the host part of, of the design for the new compute node uh, was looking at, and it was all around you know minimizing wires, keeping them short, making sure that the capability, the uh, the, the traditional way of connecting accelerators to hosts, we could create basically a topology of these. Now, obviously, what we had in the uh, design process of the new compute node was uh, the three components. So the what you can see in the middle there is a large vertex uh, ZU9 uh, that we used for acceleration capabilities. Uh, this board was targeted at what we call testbed two, where the host provided, uh, the host capability was provided by the embedded cores in the zinc, with the rest of the zinc providing the, the, the RDMA, the connectivity, the protocols, the network, uh, the, the first level of network connectivity for the XNet protocol and topologies. So that board in its own right then became the compute node. As you can see, there would have been space there for, for a fifth, an extra 15 millimeter, square millimeters, you know, sort of, sort of this sort of size chip on the device that we could have then attached one or more of the uh, memory uh, compute devices into the topology. Now, the next part I'll talk about it will be the node that the uh, the blade that joins these together, but it's in, important to point out at this point the connectivity of that board uh, was also able to use traditional hosts, and and that's where 
uh, our final targeted test bed for the Orex ASIC can actually su also support a standard uh, uh, Chrome Express, I'll describe those later, a uh, host as well. So the blade, the carrier, the blade that carries, uh, carriers are the, if you like, the boards which hold these compute modules. And this is again where the proximity based aspect comes in. The diagram itself is a mock up. This does physically exist, which you'll see on a later slide today, which basically we cram 16 of those in there. Uh, the TDP, the 200 TDP, that is the kind of thing that you would see on a 2.5 32-core Epic Roam chip. Okay, there is about 150 to 180 watts, leaving you space to put your RAMs on those. Or obviously, what we were aiming at was a 16-core ARM with an FPGA and an I/O processor within it as well to show the the increased capability of the node architecture, rather than just being a a high-density deployment of traditional nodes. Uh, in the middle of that, hidden away, is actually the the, the first level embedded switch. This is a, a, an XNX specific switch, and this has been uh, uh, implemented within an FPGA. It has the 1664 bit downlinks so it's like every node having a you know 50 gigabit ethernet in it if you like uh, with uh, eight by 100 uplinks and those uplinks have the uh, intelligence to be able to split between the network root tourists that i described but also bridge out and move across for the long haul across that uh, software defined uh, uh, open flow ethernet based uh, network also hidden under there is the uh, ssd for every node and shared management. So this is where you're starting to see, you know, if you were to deploy a traditional motherboard, every motherboard has a power management controller on it. It has all the overheads to support that one processor. Uh, this has shared infrastructure, which again, drives up the efficiency that you can see within that node. So it's not just 16 nodes, it would be more appropriate to say 16 200 watt capable accelerators with shared infrastructure. So again, the the, the, the piping, the, 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 the pumps, the feed exchanges, et cetera, are all shared within that. The power distribution is all shared. The networking capability is all shared. So this is what the kind of the boards look like. Rather than just joining all 16 together at one level, we kept this uh, quad mesh mechanism. I think it's called a king topology, where everything's directly interconnected. So these what we have is a quadrant of mesh of a quadrant of quadrant of mesh of nodes are, are, are on, on the device. And these are now uh, going uh, are available to, to, to the broader project in terms of bringing together the multi node capability of the design. And again, we, we, we uh, you know, driven by cost as much as anything, uh, bring up four uh, 16 gig links up to the blade level switch that sits in the middle of the device. <clears throat> the blade level switch is actually quite a complex little beast. So you could actually, if you were to think you have to go and buy a, a device which has 16 down ports and eight 100 gig up ports, you, you, you're, you're up to a level of what is a large commercial capable switch. Uh, we put that and uh, are developing that around a large FPGA. Uh, the board itself is using what some call uh, a cables actually rather than a uh, a PCB based routing down to those nodes. That's again a recent industry innovation that they found that actually it's easier to put high speed across cables than it is across the PCB, especially if you're trying to move, you know, 500, you know, more than a few tens of centimeters. So again, we adopted those technologies to be able to do that. And that's where we're seeing uh, that. That's all managed uh, by uh, OpenBMC or modified OpenBMC. So that you can support that many uh, shared uh, systems within it. And again, as you'd expect by any such system, it has the independent management network on it as well. So final area to look at is the deployment, the power and the cooling pulls all of that together. Clearly cooling 200 watts plus in what is basically uh, 11 by 15 uh, centimeters. So that sort of size. It is not the kind of thing you would do with a, a simple cooling fan. It's actually something you wouldn't probably want to do purely by immersion. The, the, the convection of immersion wouldn't be enough for that either. So again, huge amounts of innovation coming through, uh, supporting a, a WIA approach that uses printed 
device specific exits to balance the flow of the liquids across the devices on the selected board and then using the roll off of that to heat, heat the uh, cooler passives as well so it's it's not just like putting a liquid cool heating sink or a, 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 a cpu that's got pipes going through it this this does the whole device that allows you to get the system level power consumption up and uh, as i say the key thing that we'd, uh, we, we, we found here is that we were actually above, well, obviously above what the design point for a standard commie was. So hence, we in introduced an AUX power capability to be able to push that form factor up to the 200 plus watts uh, capability as well. And finally, the, the power, uh, the connectivity, as you can see, comes off using cables rather than the back connector. So by the time you throw that all in a box, and there's a picture of the box uh, in the top corner there, actually uh, without its lid on. So normally it wouldn't be splashing all that liquid at you in, in the data center, it would have a lid on. Uh, you, you sort of start balancing out this. The way the system uh, has been designed, there's two parts. As the, the water that is the central facility water, again, huge innovation to be able to actually bring that in at an ambient temperature, which is above most environmental and uh, uh, environmental temperatures. So what you're seeing there is useful heat coming out. And we'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide. But more importantly, we now can use the, the environment to cool rather than a huge compressor to cool. cool. So chiller cost is significantly down as well. That then goes through your heat exchanges into a dielectric liquid, which then is the stuff that actually more efficiently pulls the the heat off the components and that obviously runs at a much higher uh, rate in, 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 uh, on those and we're running at a reasonable temperature for the uh, surface or the environmental temperature around the chips and that's obviously been modeled and digital twinned all the way down to what the junction temperatures of the devices on all of the components are as well so huge innovations there and obviously i think you're seeing variants of that appear uh, more broadly than the project already so if you're pushing that level of heat at uh, blade level, what are you doing at cabinet level? And this is where some interesting findings came out. So there was a cause of, okay, if you are heating water up to 50 degrees, which is what most people have their, uh, you know, underfloor heating at or even your tap water at, do you, how, what's the difference between that and a traditional, you know, uh, oil fire boiler actually the thermal density is very similar okay so you could start saying well let's just pull the pipe out of there get rid of the boiler in the basement put this in the basement and, and run the building on the data center so the idea that we can now reuse the heat actually is part of the long story for for net to what targeting towards net zero not just efficiency of the old pue of of the design in that so very very high Things. And then remember, this has all been a holistic, what if we change the architecture so that we can get the density, because we need the density, we the density needs the heating, the heating needs the cooling, the cooling needs the efficiency. So what we get is a, the, the output of a very holistic round, rounded project on which the, the applications then have been uh, developed. So what we end up with is the, what's been deployed at the data centre, uh, a part of the data centre here in, in the UK, uh, you have a box, a big box, the things that ride around on the back of trucks. It means that they can be built and assembled as they drive around Europe. This, this one actually made its way up from Barcelona with the, you know, the, the electrics in it. And then we've connected the cable and deployed the IT that arrived in another box inside that. And it's basically been designed to be that two megawatt data center unit. OK, so very easy uh, to move. But what's more interesting with that probably is it. Oh, I lost a slide. Uh, you saw it on the first slide. You can then stack those basically. So the idea that you're not, we're 3D stacking from the silicon chip with memories all the way up to 3D stacking uh, through the blade, RAMs, networking to compute, all the way up to stacking containers to deploy data centers. So really in summary, what we've got is those two megawatt building blocks of data centers. We've got very high density nodes capability. These can be traditional nodes or the new compute nodes that we described. We extended beyond what 
physical silicon limitations or networking for scalability are prototype that up through the system and basically plug in a standard module with the latest silicon on or uh, investigate the new high density uh, locality aware nodes that we also developed in the process program so i think with that uh peter are you comparing to open up broader questions that's the idea although i've got a lot of background noise here that's it's a bit variable okay so uh um i think you know open up for broader questions and chat and then let's close down uh subsequently yeah so anybody want to pose a uh, discussion point obviously we've got quite a few of the uh, key people of the, the project on the uh, panel here so whether the panelists want to pose themselves a question or any of the attendees uh, wish to pose a question or well, please do uh, well, at the bottom of your window you'll see a q a box you can type it in anonymously so we don't need to know it was you or nobody needs to know who's asking the question either so don't be embarrassed uh, if there's anything that any of the uh, presenters have said, do feel free to uh, type away. I've also posted the gather link for anybody who wish to gather and have a chat uh, in the app afterwards as part of the virtual conference. That's been posted to the chat. So just in terms of where the project's at, just to, to we we obviously COVID hit everybody. If you're building something, especially if it's in the digital area, you get impacted bad by the COVID. So uh, the project itself was uh, due to be completing now, but we've extended to the end of the year to actually fully deploy the the, the cabinets and the test beds within that. Uh, so the you know the overall scope uh, is still on track. Anybody? I'm more than happy if everybody agrees to close the uh, session earlier. And uh, let's go ahead and close and uh, um, maybe see some people on the gather for a, a bit of a chat if needed. Okay. Any closing remarks, much. Paul? Not on mute. And so when are we going to the gather meeting? Or is it now or later? Yeah, I think we go to the gather now and then people can talk to us one to one for a little bit if they want. Okay. Okay, let's do that. Oh, no other remarks from me. Thanks, everybody. Bye then. Thanks.